So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining Viva Mundo webinar today. In this webinar, we're going to talk about studying in the US and Canada in 2021 with TOEFL Columbia University and Farley Dixon. We are going to start with Adrian Bloom, represent TOEFL, and then we will have Katerie Atkin represent Farley Dixon. And to finalize, we will have Peter Daniels representing Columbia University. If you have any doubts during the presentation, please put that on the Q&A tab on the menu below your screen. And then we will answer. Adrian, I will give the floor to you now, ready to start. Yes, thank you, Fernanda. Uh, uh, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, my name is Adjani Blom, and I work with EPS as an associate director, representing uh, both TOEFL and GRE tests here in Brazil. I am Brazilian. I live in Brasilia, and as most of you here, I have once set a plan to study abroad. And in 2011, I earned a master's degree in TISO from the University of Washington in Seattle, uh, U.S. And of course, I was required to take both TOEFL and GRE as part of the requirements to enter the university. So as you start planning to study abroad, the main question you might have right now is about what steps universities are taking to welcome international students. So uh, Peter and Gayatri, they're here to help you understand the most relevant information um, about the the whole uh, scenario that we're living right now and what you need to do in order to um, apply uh, for a program at their universities. Thank you so much Gayatri and Peter for being here. Uh, this is a great opportunity for all of us to learn uh, from you and for your uh, universities. Uh, so so uh, the main questions that you have, might have right now uh, is about what steps these universities are taking to welcome international students. Uh, so the first one is uh, try to explore. So the first thing that you should do is try to explore the country you wish to study, right? So as the situation in each country continues to evolve, governments are starting to implement measures to welcome international students. Also hold conversation with the university's representative. So this is a great opportunity that you will have uh, to, to uh, uh, listen and to hear from um, these universities and from TOEFL IBT. You will have some information, some relevant information about TOEFL IBT as well, okay? Uh, as TOEFL IBT is the, uh, it's a requirement um, uh, test for, um, for you to prove your proficiency in English. Okay. Okay. Something is happening here. So what I'm gonna do, okay. All right. So <laughs> let's talk about um, most um, destination uh, in de destination in where you can take um, you can study, you can go and you can, you can study abroad. So there are many opportunities out there, okay? Uh, for example, uh, US, okay? Uh, so the TOEFL IBT uh, um, in, in the US is nine out of 10 universities in the US prefer the TOEFL uh, over the English language tests, okay? Uh, U.S. universities receive more TOEFL scores than all other English language tests combined, okay? 
in Canada, more, more than 80% of graduate programs in Canada prefer the TOEFL IBT test over uh, other tests. Canadian universities have received more TOEFL score than all other uh, English language tests combined. In Australia and New Zealand as well, you can use your score, okay, your TOEFL score in these countries. Uh, they are accepted by all TOEFL IBT uh, scores are accepted by all Australian and New Zealand universities, okay, uh, and also from these countries, uh, immigration uh, process. For some reason, I am <laughs> having uh, uh, a hard time to um, slide to uh, pass the slides. Okay. Um, besides TOEFL IBT, there is another test that you also uh, might be required to take, okay, if you're considering graduate and business or law school, okay? And this is the GRE general test. Okay, it's used around the world, okay, not only for US, it's used around the world for master's program, specialized master's in business program, certificate in law programs, um, MBA, uh, GDA programs, doctor programs, okay, for this test, scores are good for five years, okay. And, and um, one good one information about the TOEFL IBT is that Universities, they require that the TOEFL ABT, which is an English proficiency test, scores are val valid for two years. So for more information on GRE, please visit ets.org slash GRE. I'll have some uh, um, uh, tips on test preparation uh, for you uh, to take the TOEFL ABT. This is a very, very good um, uh, prep course, okay, it's free. It's a self-paced uh, course designed by the expert, experts who created the test, okay? Uh, you'll be introduced, introduced to the test in each session of the test. It's a mix of text, short, short video lectures, sample questions, okay, from previous uh, uh, tests. Uh, for this uh, prep, of course, you receive a scaled score range for speaking and writing practice questions. Okay, so uh, there are some, um, uh, there is a, um, how can I say, you can register now because there is a, a course running right now. Okay, so please visit uh, and uh, apply for free at ets.org TOEFL Insider's Guide. There are other types of uh, preparation uh, that you can use, okay? This one is the free practice test, okay? It's a full test with all four sections and real past test questions. And uh, there are also a very good eight week preparation plan. There is also a very good preparation um, uh, plan that you can find for free online, okay? Uh, it will give tips and activities to build each of the four skills uh, assessed on the test. Uh, we also have a books. Uh, official guide to the TOEFL IBT, okay? Those are books that you can find on the uh, TOEFL IBT, the test takers IBT prepare. There is a great variety of preparation material for you to use in order to be ready, uh, to get ready uh, for success, okay? Online, you just um, please visit the test takers IBT prepare and you'll find more information, okay? So receive updates for the TOEFL IBT, okay? Uh, you uh, please, uh, I don't know if you can see from your screen, if you can see a QR code, if you cannot see it, uh, you please uh, uh, sign in on ETS TOEFL email, okay? You will you receive updates from TOEFL, you receive updates from TOEFL Essentials, which is the new TOEFL uh, that, that just uh, ETS has just released, okay? 
uh, it's a more convenient and flexible uh, ambassador uh, tests and registration starts in June. Okay, thank you so much. This is all uh, about TOEFL IBT. I hope you have enjoyed uh, this presentation. Please uh, feel free to um, sh uh, share this information and to uh, contact me. I will ask Fernanda to um, put my um, email address here so everyone can um, find out more about the TOEFL IBT. You can also uh, go on uh, all the official ETS TOEFL websites and you will find all the information that you need. So now I would like to uh, um, uh, ask, I would like to present Gayatri from Fairleigh Dixon University. She has very good and relevant uh, information to share with you about her university. Thank you, Gayatri. Thank you, Adrian. I think you might have to stop sharing. Oh, perfect. very nice to meet you all and to be here today um, to present a little bit more about my institution. Um, so I represent Fairleigh Dickinson University, which is one of the largest uh, private universities out in the East Coast next to, but close to New York City, but we are in the state of New Jersey. Fairly Dickinson was established in 1942, and for several years now, we've just finished 75 years. Um, we've, I suppose, endured through the ups and downs of the various challenges that international students face. Uh, we have two campuses in New Jersey State, and one campus out in the UK. In England, we have a, it's a study abroad location, and we've got a, a campus out in Vancouver in Canada, in British Columbia. The, the campuses in the US and in Canada will offer full degree programs and the study abroad campus in England doesn't offer a full degree program, but students can go there for an exchange semester overseas. Um, the university has several accreditations for the various specialized programs that we offer like in our business and engineering schools and so on. Uh, but overall the institutions are accredited um, by the Middle States Commission on Higher Education. And uh, we are ranked in, say, the top 50 regional um, uh, schools in the Northeast. And that's a huge honor for us because we worked very hard to be here. <laughs> uh, we've had international students for all, the, all these years. And we originally began the institution in 1942 with uh, international studies and political science, um, mostly with diplomacy, because at that time it was uh, the world war the second world war was going on and we wanted to start building bridges between the united states um, and all the countries overseas and uh, close to us as well so we currently have several states represented in our student body um, and several different countries represented we have over 70 countries right now the students that we enroll come from different countries different backgrounds and my department the international admissions office and those applicants from the undergrad, graduate, and doctoral levels. So students will apply to all levels of programs uh, to our school. And my office has been supporting international students for over 25 years now with uh, all the rules and regulations that have come out of the Department of Homeland Security. Before that, it was immigration and naturalization services and so on. Um, but our original programs were related to the United Nations. Um, and because of that, we've been ahead of the curve for um, a number of years when it comes to bringing in students from overseas and sending students abroad to our partner institutions overseas as well. So we have several opportunities for students to perform internships and to visit and learn more about the various uh, things that are going on in the United Nations as well. Our faculty serve as advisors and the university itself is recognized as an NGO to the UN. So we have four campuses um, and this presentation covers the graduate programs which are offered at our Metropolitan Campus, Florham Campus and Vancouver Campus as well. Um, the Vancouver Campus has hospitality management and administrative science. 
um, and um, applied computer sciences program. The Metropolitan and Florham campus have a number of other programs. There's a whole ton of them. I can't list all of them. Um, but they cover different programs and different uh, fields, right? So you've got business, computer science, engineering, um, teaching, supply chain management, pharmacy, um, health sciences, and um, animation, film and animation as well. Um, there's some very interesting programs that are unusual, like cosmetic science, which is the study of the formulation of fragrances and perfumes and uh, shampoos and things like that. That's a growing industry because makeup and all those products, uh, you know, they're not going away. Um, and we have more recently had uh, much interest in our health science programs, particularly because of the pandemic. People are interested in getting into the health sciences, both in a supportive administrative role, as well as in the pharmaceutical roles um, and so on, and all the related forms. Even computer science and data management and uh, engineering have a lot of interest in fields that cross over into the health sciences as well. So we offer a variety of programs and students can combine degrees and graduate um, either in a bachelor's and master's program in a combined uh, accelerated format or in um, a simple bachelor's degree then a different master's program and um, in discrete factors or in, in discrete methods, they can complete one program and start another one. Our graduate application is fully online um, and different departments have different requirements for the program. Um, so like Ediani was talking about the TOEFL requirement, we, that we, TOEFL is one of the um, schools that we accept for English proficiency. Uh, the GRA or the GMAT might be required for any uh, master's programs in business related fields. The GRE is often required for most of our STEM programs that's uh, in the science, technology, engineering and math uh, subjects. Letters of recommendation, statements of purpose, um, portfolios and all other um, requirements might be in addition to the basic transcripts, test scores. And so our requirements are fairly simple and um, easy to provide as self-reported documentation for the application purpose. So only when a student actually enrolls in the school that we would ask for official documentation. Here, just a listing of all our English proficiency requirements, um, and TOEFL is one of them. We also accept scores like Duolingo at the moment, mostly because of the pandemic and because it's accessible to students. Um, but that's a temporary measure at this time, especially for our Vancouver campus. We're focused mostly on the TOEFL and the IELTS exams. This is our cost and the total amount of this, um, what we are referring to as insurance room and board, that's for on-campus housing. With the pandemic, we've uh, in particular um, advised all of our international students coming in now to live on campus. Um, the most important reason for that is safety, both for the students and for the um, you know, faculty and university staff. And safety on many different levels. We've got you know, families who expect us to take care of their children. Um, so your parents would be most comforted if you are living in a safe environment. They're not required to live on campus, but we strongly recommend it. Even graduates, uh, graduate students can live in our campus dorms on either campus. So the application deadlines are listed here. And the vaccine requirements. Um, so we currently have um, a vaccination policy that's set up and it's on our website. Um, FDA and WHO approved vaccination will be required um, prior to entering the campus. Students who don't have access to those will be allowed to come into the US, get vaccinated, be in quarantine, and then attend classes in person as soon as they're fully vaccinated. That's within two weeks, I believe, after the second vaccine has been um, taken in for anything that requires two vaccine doses. That's our information for contacting us to ask us any questions about this. Um, and we are looking forward to welcoming all our students. And I hope you have questions <laughs> because I'd be happy to answer them later in the presentation as well. So I'd like to hand it over to Peter from Columbia. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm also coming from New Jersey, uh, USA and um, I'm a uh, admissions operations officer at Columbia Engineering, the graduate school. Uh, 
I'm filling in for the director, Gabrielle Gannon, who was uh, had a conflict, was not, not able to be here today. So uh, I'm happy to be here uh, in her place. Let me share my screen. Okay. Hope you can all see it here. So this is a general general presentation about uh, Columbia uh, University, uh, more specifically the graduate programs in engineering. So uh, thank you again for for joining, all for being here, and uh, I'm happy to be here and and uh, with all of you today. Uh, here's a statement, uh, just. Um, Talking about sort of the uh, from our president, President Bollinger, um, about the um, basically the fall term and then just the idea that we're trying to get back to normal as quickly as possible. Um, we want to have the safety of everyone in the community in mind, of course. Um, but um, of course, this is on the minds of everyone, and um, you know, more information will come certainly. So. So uh, we, have a, we have a long history of wel welcoming bright and talented students, certainly to our university. You can see some of the historical highlights um, listed on the slide here. Uh, we, were, we were founded in 1754 as King's College by a royal charter of King George II of England. We're the oldest institution um, of higher ed in New York and the fifth, fifth oldest in the US. Um, we, uh, we were renamed Columbia University in 1784. We moved to Morningside Heights. After that, uh, we're expanding, as you can see. Um, uh, most recently with a 17-acre campus, Manhattanville campus, um, and a new science center, the Jerome L. Green Science Center. So, so as, a, as a leading research uh, institution in New York City um, and an international hub and center for so many industries, we, we see Columbia Engineering as, a, as an anchor uh, in a global ecosystem. Uh, our school has a rich history going back more than 150 years, a history of breakthrough innovations and pioneering discoveries. Uh, these include the foundations for modern automatic computation, New York subway system, as well as research that enabled the mass production of a wide range of antibiotics, just to name a few. So um, we, we've also identified five core areas where we could have the greatest impact, impact uh, in sustainability, health, security, uh, con and connectivity. Um, which is how we connect and, uh, and communicate with each other locally around the world, and also creativity, um, how engineers develop creative solutions and how we enable the, uh, the creativity of others. So you can see, you can see the, um, how we're enabling uh, discovery in, in technological breakthroughs by transcending disciplines um, from all those you see listed on the screen there. So we, we believe this vision combined with the technical river, rigor of our programs, um, our location in New York City, and the many opportunities we provide for research, entrepreneurship, and design uh, make, make for a unique educational experience that gives Columbia engineers an advantage um, as they build their careers or, or seek further educational experience. We are organizing our strengths as school around centers that are de dedicated to the fastest growing sectors in technology and research. We have the Columbia IBM Center for Blockchain and Data Transparency, uh, a center for financial uh, technology, artificial intelligence and business analytics, the Columbia Electrochemical Energy Center for Batteries and Energy Storage. We are a national test bed for wireless technology, our square mile uh, around our school has been outfitted with sensors for research that, uh, that will advance 5G and Internet of Things. We have a, a center dedicated to in intelligent asset management that studies core problems in finance. It focuses on behavioral finance, machine learning, data science, and modern portfolio theory. We're also part of a new lab dedicated to augmented and virtual reality. 
On top of that, we have established institutes and centers that are hubs of pan dis disciplinary research. You can see those listed on the screen there. We have more than 220 faculty throughout our nine departments affiliated with these centers, and they provide a great research resource for students interested in these areas of research. This is truly an exceptional roster um, to leading experts in their respective fields. Uh, this spring, eight members of our junior faculty won National Science Foundation Career Awards. This is a prestigious early career award for young faculty, and it's truly incredible to have eight winners in one year. Uh, recently, we, we have also had faculty inducted into the National Academy of Engineering, and one, one of our faculty just won the Com Comstock Prize for Physics. So, of course, our, our student body is also quite impressive, uh, with several students gaining recognition recently from, from J.P. Morgan, Facebook, IBM, Microsoft, and major government agencies. Joining Columbia Engineering community uh, means, means joining a very accomplished community. Um, it's made up of CEOs, CTOs, and even astronauts. I'm sure uh, many of you recognize these organizations, uh, Boeing, Bloomberg, Disney. Um, Face++ Plus Plus is an organization that some of you may not know, but it's a company that, that one of our recent alumni founded. At Columbia, we, had, we have a culture of, of design, innovation, and entrepreneurship uh, across the school and, and, and university with countless opportunities for, for graduate students to conduct uh, translational research. Uh, we're, we're also expanding. Uh, space is always critical when, you, when you're located on an, on an island, uh, but we have, we have plans and progress to expand our space on campus and, and provide even more labs and spaces for students. We already have a presence at the Columbia Medical Center uh, and in Manhattanville at the Mind Brain Behavior Institute. We're also expanding up further in Upper Manhattan. We, we have a, a city within a city, so to speak, right in our backyard, and, and this provides ample opportunity for re, uh, real world research and collaborations with city and in, uh, industry. So we, we envision a, a, a rich ecosystem for innovation and discovery that connects, connects Columbia with, with pro partners across the whole city. Um, so we also have a, a dedicated career uh, placement and professional development and leadership team for students. Um, it starts in the summer um, and it continues throughout your program. Uh, you, can, you can see the various um, benefits on the screen there of, of, how, of um, how these teams um, help our students. Um, these are some more of the areas that uh, Basically, our, our, our teams um, help in preparing your students, students for, for, for these various, um, for, for um, their studies and afterward. Uh, and, and this is, um, this is a list here of, of the career placement coaches that you would um, be uh, in constant contact with, um, depending on your uh, department and program study. And uh, these are just uh, a list of various companies that um, we have successfully partnered with with our students um, after graduation. So thank, thank you again for, for being here and I hope to see um, some of you um, again in the future at Columbia Engineering. Thank you. I think I'm going to turn it over um, back to the moderator. So thank you, Peter. Thank you, Gayatri. Thank you, Adian, for the presentation. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please put on the Q&A tab. We don't have any uh, for now. Uh, so if you want to add something, if you want to say some more words to finalize. Yeah, I thank you very much, Peter and Gayatri, for your presentations. I think you brought a lot of very good information related to your universities. You know that uh, U.S. is uh, the biggest country uh, with the highest number of Brazilian universities. Uh, I mean, I mean Brazilian students, and um, I saw. Uh, I saw that you 
uh, you talked about uh, the score. Uh, Gayatri, you talked about the TOEFL score for uh, Fairleaf Jigs Jigson, and it, it looks like it's about 70. So big questions that I receive every time that I am with uh, in contact with the students, which is all the time, <laughs> all the time I have questions from students, mainly about uh, TOEFL score, TOEFL scores, uh, which, what, what, besides the, the TOEFL scores, what else, what is, what is your university's, uh, 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 what are universities looking for uh, in a potential student? Because they are worried like, oh, besides the TOEFL, what else should they bring? Of course, they know all the, all that list of, uh, 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 statement of purpose, uh, uh, letter of presentation, and but besides the English proficiency, which is really really important for them to uh, to be able to uh, to be successful, at least in the first year, we know that the English the the English that they are proving to have will be very helpful for their first year. We know that after that they they will uh, they the English the English that they learn by studying for the TOEFL IBT and that they will learn during their first year will be uh, very very high level. But what else are you looking for in a potential student? Uh, for example, what else it's like it, it uh, stand out uh, for them like would be a potential skill for the students to be admitted in your universities? Well, um, let me answer a little bit in a general way. <laughs> and then yeah. I'll send it over to Peter as well in case he can add something to that. Um, I think I used to be an international student myself. I didn't speak much about myself. Um, I grew up in Sri Lanka. And uh, I was an FDU student and I just fell in love with the school and the opportunities that they offered. That's why I stayed on as, um, I first started as an admissions counselor, then worked my way up as, and now I'm finally the director of international admissions. Um, throughout this entire process, one thing I learned was your English proficiency score is good. That helps you. It really helps you save money because the better your English is, the more you're going to get out of your student experience in the US um, and out of the education system as well because it's heavily based in English in the US. We're not translating much of our coursework, um, at least not easily anyway. Um, and so the English preparation is one component that we look for in terms of what, what kind of a fit would the student be for our institution. But there's more to it and it depends on the institution itself. Um, so speaking as an institution that's really trying to be inclusive and bring in more students and we're trying to increase our diversity, we're looking at uh, non-traditional factors. So we're not looking at the highest IQ, we're not looking at the highest scores, we're looking at students who bring a little bit of interesting character because our school is also an interesting character. So we're looking for a good fit in that respect. We're not looking for a student who would be a better fit for Columbia, for instance. So we, we have that in mind when we're reviewing an application. Um, and a student doesn't necessarily need to worry about that part of it when applying to an institution like Fairleigh Dickinson. If a student is more interested in getting into a school like Columbia, which probably has a much more selective and focused way of looking at applicants, um, then I'm sure there are different criteria that go into that. So it really depends on the school that the student is applying to. So the type of institution that you're applying to might actually tell you what type of student they're looking for. Whereas if you actually reach out and speak with an admissions counselor, you might get a better sense of what they're looking for. From my institution standpoint, we have uh, different schools of uh, studies. So we've got business schools, we've got a pharmacy school, natural sciences and so on. Each one of those is going to look for some kind of background in their field of study. So if a student has more experience in, in the academic sector, say a, a bachelor's degree in something that is related, um, and the student did well in that, and the student is following up with a master's degree or a doctoral degree in that same subject, that would be helpful. So that's one of the basic foundations of the application. To support that, if a student has good letters of recommendation, um, 
other tests that we didn't even ask for. <laughs> Sometimes that helps. It just depends on the department, more specialized tests. Um, say a student is finishing a bachelor's degree in one subject, but is re-specializing in something else. Then a solid statement of purpose, explaining their interest, fully understanding what it is they're going into, that would really be helpful. Um, and so it's stuff like that. Basically, it really depends on where the student is coming from and where they're going. So the destination matters in the journey. I hope that helps. Peter, if you'd like to add something to that, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I, I would, yeah, no, thank you. I would, I would agree with much of that, certainly. Um, I mean, I can only speak for graduate engineering programs, um, but we certainly take a, a holistic view of, of the applicant. Um, they're generally speaking, and, you know, no cutoff scores, um, you know, hard cutoff scores. And um, a lot of it has to do with the, uh, the research interest of the, um, of the applicant and how serious they are and uh, with working with faculty that they, they've researched and, um, you know, know about the, the, the work of the faculty member and um, if it's a good fit, um, certainly that, that helps. And let, letters of recommendation are very important, certainly, um, to just give credibility and um, vouch for candidates. Um, and um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, we have, a, we have many different uh, departments, many different programs. So um, each, each program has their own sort of criteria that they tend to stress. Um, but, um, yeah, I just, you know, the, it, it's, it, it's hard to kind of, um, uh, you know, there, there's no, uh, there's not a set of metrics really that really is, is, it's not quantifiable really, um, in any sort of hard, hard sense. So, um, it's a sort of a holistic approach and, um, scores are, are part of that certainly. And, um, obviously we, we get a lot of international students. We have a large international population at the graduate level. We have, I think over 80% of our students are international. So many of them are required to submit test scores for, for example, for the TOEFL or um, IELTS score, or whatever English language tests is, uh, they, they choose. And um, um, it's important that they are, uh, you know, able to communicate in, in English um, on some level, of course. Um, and, um, but but as you said, once once they kind of get get to uh, the campus and they start to um, you know uh, sort of acclimate to the culture and, and get used to using the language, that it becomes more about their uh, research and academic interests, and um, and then um, you know the language kind of takes care of itself. I think. So. Yeah. As a graduate student at the University of Washington in Seattle, uh, um, I got the, the, the score that was required by the university, uh, but I really, really, really improved my, my, my English in the first year that I was there, especially academic English. And, and have studied through the TOEFL IBT, it helped me a lot because it's 100% academic content. And, but there, when I was there, you know, doing all those, um, uh, uh, having all those commun communications uh, at the university, outside the university, off campus and on campus, uh, it they really, really helped me to improve my English. And um, it's amazing that uh, your English can, like you said, Gayatri, your English can make everything easier when you are outside <laughs> outside your country you know in english country and uh, i think it's uh, it's great that uh it's a great experience studying abroad it's a great experience in all aspects i would say any question uh any other questions that we have fernanda Yes, we have here two questions. Uh, I don't know if can who can enter escort into Columbia Medical School. So, so I'm um, I can only speak for the School of Engineering uh, and Applied Science. So, 
the, the College of Physicians and Sur Surgeons is a different um, uh, school within Columbia uh, up at the medical center. So I, um, you know, I wouldn't be able to really speak on their behalf. And so the next question is for Columbia University. What is the different types of financial aid available? Um, so, so there is, um, I mean, we do have fellowships uh, and scholarships that um, you can apply for. Um, some of those are uh, dependent on your, uh, you know, what country of origin you're from and um, if you're, if you're a U.S. citizen, you can, of course, um, get federal loans and, um, and that type of thing. Um, but uh, we do have a, a, some generous scholarships and fellowships that um, you, you'd be automatically, automatically considered for. Um, and it's some, some that you have to apply for, but, um, you know, it, it, it depends on the academic program you're applying for. Um, and in the nature of the scholarship. So um, it's a little bit of a broad question, but there's certainly financial aid uh, available and, and PhDs of course are, are fully funded. So they, they, um, they will be, um, uh, you know, be fully funded throughout their um, course of study. Um, and master prog master's programs, as I said, are a little bit more, um, you know, they, they tend not to be, but there are fellowships and scholarships to defray the cost uh, to some degree, yes. Okay, we have only those two questions. So we're going to, going to end for today. Do you want I to say uh, final words? I, to end I, presentation? I think I, have, I think I have one more question. Yes, of course. Yeah, for both, for, for Gatti and Peter, uh, regarding um, uh, teaching and research requirements on your areas, on your universe, at your universities. Uh, we have a big number of teachers uh, here in Brazil. They are very interested in studying abroad and having uh, a broad experience and researching. And what would be the requirement for teaching, uh, for example, can they teach um, for, for them to, for example, uh, research? Can they teach, do you have a Portuguese program that they can teach their native language? Uh, and also, what would be the requirements for teaching and, and research on the graduate level? That's a question that comes up to me every time that I am with a uh, graduate, uh, teachers, uh, graduate uh, students, and who wants to study abroad? Peter, do you want to take a little bit of that first? Um, I, I mean, I think um, oftentimes the PhD students will, will be TAs, um, teaching assistants, um, which, and they will also receive a stipend and that you know their, their tuition will be um, covered as well, but I think master students can also um, do that. Uh, not, not it's not as common. Um, the uh, but yeah, I think I think it's mostly reserved for PhD PhD students, uh, basically as faculty assistants, um, at least at Columbia Engineering and the graduate school. Thank so, you, Pete. Just to add on to that, um, yeah, doctoral level students typically are coming into a level of research that's you know, very program specific. Um, as far as Portuguese, I don't think I'm, my school does not have that as a field of study for research. Um, our psychology program is, is our school of psychology basically has uh, PhD programs that uh, students can get into. But teaching itself as a in the School of Education, in New Jersey at least, our students have to be either US citizens or permanent residents of the US because 
part of their practical curriculum is to go into schools and teach. And you can only do that if you have a license. And the only people who can get licenses in New Jersey State, at least, are you know citizens or permanent residents. Um, there are some programs, though, like teaching English as a second language, which we offer at the master's level. Um, and that is open to international students. So students who have basically the 70 TOEFL can come in and we help students uh, get their master's degree. But it's a master of arts. It's not a master of arts in teaching. It's mm. a master of arts in teaching English as a second language, second or foreign language. Um, at the undergrad level, we have a similar problem, which is um, that part of the curriculum involves that practical component. Um, so students can't really study the quest of what we call the quest program, which is um, teaching at the undergrad level, learning education and so on. We have several specializations, including learning disabilities and so on, but um, unfortunately students can't really get into that um, if they're coming from overseas without the um, residency or certification, the licensure to complete the program. But they can still take courses. So there are some schools, they can take concentrations in those subjects. They can take education concentrations in any other major. So like the STEM subject, science subject, math, and so on. But uh, research-wise, it's tricky when it's very specialized like Portuguese. Yeah. Yeah. I ask that mainly because uh, when I, in my experience, student is uh, studying abroad, I was able to be a uh, Portuguese, uh, uh, have a Portuguese teaching assistantship. It was very, very, uh, uh, was a very good opportunity because I could uh, share my experience with a Portuguese teaching with uh, the students at the university and helped a lot to pay my tuition. And I always share that with, with, with uh, the students that they should look for their inform that information um, on the web page of the university that they uh, uh, intend to study if they offer that type of uh, uh, assistancy, that type of uh, uh, scholarship, that type of uh, support for the, for the student who has a teaching uh, degree. Thank you. Thank you both for responding. So we have uh, two questions more. We have a few minutes to end. So two, uh, two questions are about scholarship, full scholarship for both universities, if you have. Uh, and a question for Columbia University. What academics do I need to maintain in my high school to make a good profile for applying to Columbia University? So, so unfortunately, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not part of undergraduate admissions, so I don't really, um, I can't really advise you um, in that regard uh, terribly accurately, but um, it's obviously a very selective, university um, uh, to attend as an undergraduate. Um, but I would have to have you, um, you know, peruse the undergraduate admissions website and really just do a little bit of your research on your own. Um, we, there are uh, undergraduate engineering programs that we have uh, through at Columbia College and Columbia Engineering. Um, but um, I'm just not, you know, familiar with the the uh, you know the typical uh, entering student and what you know they really look for. So um, I'm afraid I can't really be too helpful on that one. I can add a little bit about um, undergrad admissions. Usually, you can't really ask that question how to improve your profile if you're looking at school and you have to do the best that you can. You have to focus on it. Um, and you have to remember that the higher your grades, the better your chances. So um, that's essentially all you can do. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's nothing, there's no magic you know, number that you can say which would perfectly qualify a student for admission. Um, because it doesn't really matter. Sometimes it doesn't really depend on grades, but sometimes grades matter. So it's very difficult to answer that question in terms of uh, what type of background we're looking for for admission. 
um, think logically, if you would want to consider, perhaps if you're interested in, say, an engineering program, your math skills have to be strong. If you have struggled in mathematics in your high school uh, classes, then you might want to take exams outside of that, say, the SAT or any other tests that show that your mathematic ability is higher than it looks on your grades. So things like that, there are ways to supplement. Um, regarding your question about full scholarships, um, as Peter mentioned, certain doctoral programs would definitely, um, that those that are funded would allow you to come in fully funded. But at the undergrad and grad level, it really depends on the program and whether or not there are academic awards available to international students. Um, my school, Fairleigh Dickinson, has uh, Division I athletics at the Metropolitan Campus, so students often combine academic and athletic awards and they get a full ride. Um, but it's only when they're at that level of competition that they can perform in their sport. Um, but otherwise, most of our students come in on a partial award. And they have to pay something or the other for school. I hope that helps. So thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian, for the presentation today. It was very clarifying. And we're going to end presence with us this afternoon. And bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.